collection or pieces of the collection with me. And so uh, the Marriott was very generous in giving me, yes, very generous in giving us an upgraded room, a two bedroom suite for $71. So hopefully he can come with his family and go uh, swimming next door because believe it or not, it's open here in Minneapolis. But to get started, people ask me why, how did you even get this collection? It is probably the largest uh, private collection in, in, in the world of artifacts related to the Holocaust. And I am a collector. I'm a collector of people and things. And I'm not a reader. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty proud to say that only one person on earth was not happy that I got a 12 on my ACT in English, and that was my mother. So I learned through holding objects. I learned through uh, touching things. And as much as I love museums, I, it just kills me that things are locked up behind uh, a display case or even worse, uh, locked up in archives where you really need to be uh, somebody, somebody to get the right to go look at these uh, incredible artifacts that, that exist in museums. So I like to bring the pieces right to the students, right to the general public so they can touch and feel the artifacts, the witnesses that were involved in the Holocaust or any genocide like Rwanda, for example. So that's the premise of what we do is that we are just another good piece to a good rounded education besides textbooks. And of course, the primary source themselves, the survivors like Agnes Schwartz, the artifacts is just way, another way to open up the minds of people. And I think uh, just very, very incredible. So tonight we're going to be more informal and Keel ask questions and we can ask questions back and forth. And if anybody wants to jump in, it's no problem. Uh, Keel, where do you want to go from here? Well, I want to mention too that um, our presentation is organized around five different segments. So first we'll talk about, um, as a prelude, Danny will talk about uh, an entry point into understanding these objects, these artifacts as evidence. Um, and then we will uh, go for five different themes, um, the victims, the perpetrators, the righteous, the children, and the future, the legacies, the recent past and that which has been lost. So we'll offer um, artifacts on each of these things. And what you'll see is just a glimpse into the collection. We uh, would love to be there with you next year uh, in person where you can see uh, the whole thing. So um, Danny, I'm gonna start with sure. these if that's okay. Please yep. go ahead. And if you have questions as, you, uh, as we go along, please feel free to pop them into the chat and I'll try to pay attention to the chat. Um, and we'll just uh, take it from there. Thank you for being our test audience for this new uh, document camera we're working with. It's called an Elmo. So when students arrive to our venue, generally speaking, I have between 14 and 22 tables, eight feet long, rectangular shape, and it's in a U shape. Uh, so they get to see chronologically what we have to offer. So when students come to our exhibit, the first thing they see is our maps. We don't judge people in their geography knowledge. We want to make their experience uh, uh, wonderful. We don't want to assume they have to know geography. So they'll see maps and then they'll see two pieces of cloth. They'll see the, the yellow Jewish star and they'll see the Nazi armband and they can pick them up. They can literally pick up the Nazi armband and the Jewish star. We don't mind at all. We do have the Jewish star propped up higher on a little easel, which I could have even done here. I didn't think about that. And we lay down the Nazi armband on the ground. That's just my little way of saying that the Jewish star rises up to the sky and is, is more powerful. But in reality, they are just pieces of cloth. So the cloth themselves, the symbols themselves are uh, don't have any meaning, but the people who wore them, they are the perpetrators or the victims. So the Nazi symbol themselves might not be so bad as a symbol to a student, but when you wear it, it brings you power and allows you to be a perpetrator in this case. Students come to our exhibit with uh, an assignment. They must write an essay as if they were the piece or write a letter to that piece of how they feel about that piece, how they feel about this piece of cloth or about this postcard and letter. That's how we generally go about it. Okay, next. I wanted to mention too that we have our uh, dear friends Kevin Ostoyich uh, and Jim Schuster, two wonderful Holocaust educators who are used to working with the collection too. So um, gentlemen, please, if you have um, specific anecdotes about any of these things, feel free to chime in. Danny, I just had one question for you about these. 
are these quote unquote real? These are authentic. Everything in our exhibit is authentic. I do have it in our introduction table, a book's called Counterfeiting the Holocaust. And I do have fake artifacts because many people come to me and say, oh, I'm gonna go on eBay or I saw this on eBay, a Nazi armband, a Jewish star, a piece of the Holocaust. Uh, generally speaking, it's very, very dangerous. And we have warning signs saying, please don't try to buy this on the internet. It's very, very da uh, dangerous. While uh, Kiel mentioned uh, Kevin Ostoyich, we have thousands of pieces. And if I am not using our pieces for an exhibit, I love giving them to universities or to museums on loan. So Kevin Ostoyich, who will speak later at Valparaiso University, he actually has hundreds of pieces that he uses each year for his courses, and he'll talk about that. So the first thing people see after the cloth is they see a postcard from a concentration camp in Croatia. And what's significant about this piece is that in the back of the postcard, it has uh, five different lines of which an uh, inmate can write a few words on each line. There are restrictions. And at the bottom, it says, writing is a reward for good work and good behavior. This allows you the right to receive packages. So if you're a good slave, you get to write something. Because we try to get in these children into the mindset of what is a letter. We had one uh, expert, Robert Jan van Pelt, say, Danny, Danny, back off a little bit. Start from the beginning. Why letters? Why are letters important? And we like to say that communication started with, let's say, smoke signals, homing pigeons, the Pony Express, letters put on trains, airplanes, the post office. Life was much less complicated. Back in the day, especially during the Holocaust era, eating and writing, the ability to communicate, to get their message out to a loved one was extremely powerful. So before MySpace, your space, iPhones, Facebook, Instagram, now this new thing called TikTok, before all that, young people, you can actually take a pen and a piece of paper or a postcard and write a letter or a postcard to a loved one. They have to, we have to put them back into that time set of what is a letter. A letter is just a manual email. An email shows who is it sent from, the to, the sender, the date, just like an envelope or postcard with a cancellation mark. Who's it going to, who's it from? So we wanna bring students back into that world of the importance of writing a letter. Because back in the day, you used to run to the post box. I remember my brother and I running home. Who can get home faster to check the mailbox? Do we get something from our grandparents? So we want to bring him back into that era. And when you were back in the Holocaust era, these victims in the ghettos and camps, they just wanted food and the ability to write and communicate with a loved one. If I go to the, go to the other side just for one moment. Sure. So this is the back. We like students to pick up. They always pick up things and they flip things around. So here's the front of the postcard. It looks very simple. This is the, the concentration camp postcard stationery. Concentration camps had pre-printed postal stationery. Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Dachau, and all the major camps and smaller camps like this one in Croatia had their concentration camp emblem. And the backside, this kid can flip back over, shows you the few lines and then the ability with the comment on the bottom that you have received, you were a good slave and because you were good that day or that moment, this gives you the ability to write this postcard as a reward. Okay, next. Okay, so now let's move into the segment on the victims uh, and the survivors. And as we look at these, we'll perform a little analysis to see what can we tell about the lives, the experiences of these uh, prisoners who were uh, in concentration camps, ghettos, and so forth. So, Danny, what are we looking at here? So. What's interesting when you go through our exhibit or you go through any museum exhibit, and of course the US Holocaust Museum and all major museums, they have hundreds and hundreds of postal stationary letters and postcards. What's interesting, Dachau, for example, which was established in 1933, on the left side of all the stationery, there are, there are um, requirements. There are things that are rules, regulations of what you can and cannot say on your postcard. And as the years, moved on, the number of regulations got more and more complicated and more and more of them. So it gets really in fine print. So this is a postcard from 1937, which really outlines, if you want to scroll up, about four, is it four or nine? I can't remember. 
This one has this uh, one. This one has four. Four different things that you can save. So if if you want to read those four items real quick. Sure. It says the following instructions are to be observed in written communications with each prisoner. One, each prisoner may receive and send one letter or one card each week from and to his relatives. Letters to the prisoner must be legibly written and may contain only 15 lines on one page. Only one normal size letter sheet is permitted. Envelopes must be unlined. Only five 12 Finnig stamps may be enclosed in one letter. Everything else is forbidden and subject to confiscation. Postcards have 10 lines. Two, sending money is permitted. Three, newspapers are permitted. However, they may only be ordered through the postal authorities of KL Dachau. Four, packages may not be sent since the prisoners can buy everything in the camp. All mail that does not meet these requirements is returned to the sender. If no sender is known, it will be destroyed. So keep it up for one moment. So I look at, I'm not looking at anybody really. I only see a few faces, but to me, you're all students. You're all wonderful high school looking students. Congratulations, you all look wonderful. So I tell students, can you imagine? And actually you're not allowed to imagine, but the fact that you today, you get a text, probably students average a text every five minutes. And I'm being very conservative. They probably get a text every one minute. So here in this case, uh, victims in the ghetto and camp system, they can get and they can send one letter or one postcard a week. That is in just an enormous a burden on your soul back in the day when students today, we text literally every minute. There's some form of, of social media, some form of communication hitting us in any one direction. That's why this is very, very important. So this is 1937. You'll see other uh, letters and postcards where the regulations are much deeper, much more specific, and much more dangerous. And what this piece tells me, Danny, one thing that it tells me is that these prisoners existed in a world of intense and complex, confusing rules and regulations that were constantly changing. And when we look at this piece here from Sachsenhausen, we'll see something in particular that uh, Danny will want to point out. Um, what are we looking at here? So this, it's a little, it's, I don't know if you can tell, but this is actually from Sachsenhausen. It's stationary, but I unfolded it because up in the right-hand corner, right in this spot, right over here. Let's see, where is it? Right there. Uh, I can't really get to it. Uh, it's not going there, but right in that corner, where is Which it? Which one? The stamp right here in this oh, corner, yeah. right here. So in this corner right here, that's, those you, you can see the outline of where two stamps were. And if you zoom in on that, if you zoom in, I don't know if you can, how deep we can get, it says where the two stamps were. So someone wrote this message and then covered up with two stamps. You are not allowed to ask for anything specific. So in this instance, the writer acknowledges getting a parcel, but is asking for food. Totally illegal. If this prisoner, this victim, got caught, we don't even know what happened. I mean, he'd probably, he or she would probably be murdered. So on the back side of this keel is the actual stationery itself. So this is, this is the envelope where you fold it in one direction and you can see up on top, oh, it's upside down, but you can see the regulations at concentration camp, uh, uh, Oranienburg, which is Sachsenhausen. And this is the regulations that you're allowed to say what you can say on the letter. So it's actually a form sheet and you fold it up into a, a regular envelope and you can see where the stamp was. Many, many letters, when, when many letters that we get in our collection have no stamps, the stamps are removed. Not because little kids are trying to soak the stamp off to put in their stamp collection, but they're looking for a message. So if you go back to the other side, you can see, again, you can see the cancellation, the little cancellation mark where it was going to Germany. So right here, that's part of the cancellation. The other half of the cancellation was on the stamps itself. So when the receiver of the letter got this, they knew to bleed off the stamp and see if there's a message. Very powerful. I hope you all can see these pretty clearly. Okay, so we all know the depravity, uh, the conditions that the prisoners existed in, um, these victims and survivors. And yet this is something that we see uh, 
in many instances throughout the collection is hand painted, hand drawn artwork, beautiful pictures um, from these prisoners, which I think uh, to exist in such a world and to still be able to create such beauty, I think is a reflection of uh, something of the resilience of the human spirit. And so here we see um, a postcard from Westerbork, um, the, the concentration camp where Anne Frank uh, was also imprisoned. And this is written in Dutch. You can see on uh, the, the bell here, the word Vreda, question mark, 1943. Vreda is Dutch for peace. So the postcard uh, author is wondering, um, will we have peace in 1943? So in this case, this, yeah, this was a Christmas and uh, basically a Christmas and New Year's card sent to the grandparents of the one interned at Westerbork, that's where Anne Frank was. And uh, the reason why Kiel picked this piece out of the hundreds of pieces, it says peace, 1943, question mark. So I'm surprised this one got, this postcard actually got out. Um, but it's a very, I love artwork on Holocaust mail. So you'll see a lot more of that on the, during the exhibit. And you can see the front and the back. The way you exhibit the cards is that the original card is on the, on the, the drawing. And then we can shrink down the envelope because you're not allowed to show exact dimensions if you're going to make a copy of something. So the side that shows the stamp, that's actually reduced in size. But normally what we'll do is in the future, we'll cut out the whole picture. And so kids can turn and flip back and forth both sides at one time. Um, and so on the, the point about the artwork here, we have another example. What's interesting about this, this is uh, Easter. And of course we're up coming upon Easter right now in another week. This is a postcard sent to a prisoner in Auschwitz. So if you scroll down just a little bit, you can see that you'll see the words right over, uh, he, right here, you'll see that this was approved by the Commandant, KL uh, Auschwitz. So it was approved to be sent and given to a distributor. But this is a hand-drawn painting, hand-drawn postcard for Easter 1944. But what makes this card uniquely special, Kiel, do you have the other, the first page of that? There it is right here. Why don't you put that one to wrap on top? In 1944, in March, this is a notice that was put inside of a piece of stationery from a sender. And it said on, on the card, if you want to read the top, Kiel. It says, Eastern Pentecost parcels for protective custody inmates have not been allowed. Inquiries about this to the commander's office of KL Auschwitz are useless, signed the camp commander. So in March 1944, notices went out with all letters that we are not allowing any Easter parcels. There must have been some type of punishment that week. We don't know. Uh, there's a lot of information that we, we can get from Auschwitz itself. But this is official notice that they're not allowing any Easter communications into Auschwitz in 1944. And yet, days later, this Auschwitz postcard that you just saw, the next one, the one that was the drawing, the beautiful drawing right here, it, it got through the system. So someone had a, an ounce of humanity to let the postcard in and it was approved on the back side of it, you would see that it was approved to be released and given to the inmate at Auschwitz. How are we doing, we're all doing okay? Everybody good? Good, I see some, as long as you see the faces going up and down, I'm happy. So let's move on, Danny, to our next segment on the perpetrators. And what we're looking at here, this is a couple parts to this one. Um, I'm gonna start with this one here. What are we looking at here, Danny? Well, you tell me. Okay. I'm upside down right now. So, so this is a Nazi produced document, uh, which is an official document attesting to uh, the guard Josef Haft's exemplary service, satisfactory service as a Dachau guard from May 3rd to September 16th, 1933. Correct. So it's interesting about this, this Nazi guard and, and this postcard in general. So here's the separate item. I want to make sure Kiel gets down there. There's the postcard. There's a postcard that this prison guard wrote in May 1933. Now we know that I was, uh, Dachau was established in uh, March of 1933. It's when it opened. And he, this guard wrote a postcard to his family saying that life is pleasant. I like my job here at Dachau. 
And there's a nice picture of Doc Gow with the trees in the background and the, the photographer made it look really nice. And this guard says, you know, I, I like my job. It, well, things are pleasant. I'm doing well here. I'm being taken care of. So here's a postcard from a guard saying, I like my job. Again, I, I must admit it's 1933 in May and in Dachau was built not for the Jews, it was built for the political prisoners and anybody who objected to Hitler. So the Jews didn't start coming in big time until later years, Kristallnacht, but uh, even 1933, the, the guards were getting used to the fact that they are gonna be in charge of prisoners who are against the Nazi regime. And so here we have the note from the guard on the back of the postcard um, canceled at uh, Dachau. And, uh, you know, I, I heard Paul Salmons, the, um, the historian and educator, talking recently about um, what we can learn from the perpetrators, because this is, uh, you know, something throughout um, historiography. Uh, and when you look at the permanent exhibit at Auschwitz, for example, you never, you never see uh, the faces of the perpetrators, except incidentally in photographs, um, because the victims are the subject and, and to spend precious uh, exhibit space on the perpetrators is um, almost sacrilege, right? Uh, but Paul said something interesting, which is that when we constantly ask this question, how was it possible that people could go along with this, that so many people could participate, um, the victims can't tell us that by looking at the minds of the perpetrators, what their daily experience was, these postcards they're writing home, how, how they became accustomed to this very inhumane and abnormal situation and making it normal is something that we can learn from. So um, moving on here to our next piece, which is rather large, I'll just... This is the piece right here. It's going to be a little tough for you to see. We'll just so, ladies start and gentlemen, here. this is what I was when I was a stamp. I'm a, I'm a stamp collector. I think I mentioned to those who are on earlier that I'm a collector of people and things, and I don't read well. So I was a buyer at Marshall Fields Department Store in Skokie, Illinois. I was a buyer and seller of stamps and coins because Marshall Fields they had concessions, and then believe it or not, there were stamp and coin departments all over the United States. But it, it was my friends in high school that said, Danny, stamp collectors don't get married. You got to start doing other things, you know, having fun in life, you know, so put your stamps away. Of course, that hurt me. But then I became famous for having really good parties in, in the department, in the stock room. But when I went back into stamp collecting, uh, after my kids were older, I found uh, in Pennsylvania, this man, Ken Lawrence, that's not, it's not his real name. And he had a piece of Jewish scripture. Can you go out? Can you zoom out? So this is a piece of Jewish scripture from the story of David and Goliath. And it's a piece of Torah, uh, it's a Daka scroll. And it was ripped apart on the Russian front because after June, 1941, Germany says to Russia, I don't want you as a friend anymore. We're gonna go invade Russia. And as they're ra ra uh, raiding towns and invading cities on the way to Moscow, these groups of Nazis would rip apart everything that's Jewish. And in this case, this corporal took a piece of the Tadaka, the scroll, ripped it apart, and sent it back to his family in Austria. And if you look, it says Feldpost up on this part right here. Feldpost means free post, because anybody in the military, even the Allies, had free postage. But in this case, it was too heavy. So here, they had to pay a penalty, because the piece, the parcel that was inside this wrapped envelope of Jewish scripture was too heavy. So we know, because of this corporal's ID number over here, where he was, where the troops were at the time, and we can trace this, the, this troop itself. So this is a piece of Jewish scripture with a, a Hitler, a Nazi cancellation right over here. It's worn out a little bit. And this is one of my most powerful pieces. This is what attracted me to buy the whole exhibit itself. Showing also the complete lack of regard for Jewish cultural and sacred objects. As rip well. it apart. Rip apart the culture. Rip apart the people. Of course, save some Torahs because Hitler wanted to build a museum with extinct people. So many Torahs were confiscated and sent to Czechoslovakia for storage until after the war when they were supposed to win. Of course, they never did. So now moving. These are all, I'm talking to students all the time. I want to get them involved at a very basic level. Moving along briskly here, 
Um, what I love this piece. At? This is you. Uh, your organization knows Agnes Schwartz very, very well, and she speaks to all your students and your general public. Her father was saved by Ron Wallenberg. He had something called a Schutz Pass, which I have three of them, by the way, but I forgot to bring it. In the meantime, several people in, in Budapest, several people were issue, issuing letters of protection. And one famous unknown person, more or less, and a favorite of Michael Berenbaum, by the way, is Bishop Angelo Rhoda. Bishop Angelo Rhoda, against the wishes of the Vatican, decided to issue letters of protection, saying you are now under my guardianship and we are, you're gonna be placed into one of my international ghetto buildings, one of the buildings that we purchased to protect you. So here is a bishop writing letters of protection to Jewish people saying that if, as long as you have this letter, you are under the protection of me, Bishop Angel Rhoda. Amazing piece. I have three of these pieces, by the way. I can't get enough of them. I love them. I love this piece very, very much. He's a righteous among nations, a very important figure. Ron Wallenberg is famous because it's Ron Wallenberg. But Ron Wallenberg, he was late to the game. There were other people ahead of him. Carl Lutz, for example. And so there's a very great piece, and I love it myself. So this piece here was uh, dated November 15th, 1944, written for Jewish widow Riedel Emilne, maiden name Irene Ferretti, signed by Angelo Rhoda, and it enabled the widow's life to be saved and be transferred to the quote-unquote international ghetto. Um, and one thing that I think is worth noting is that Rhoda did not require uh, the people that he issued these letters to to be baptized. So keep in mind that we're showing you maybe 25 pieces today or something out of hundreds. We generally do not exhibit less than, let's say, 300 pieces, which tells the whole story. So I'm, you have to fill in a lot of blanks right now. Uh, you very astute students uh, have to know a little bit about Budapest. And again, uh, Agnes Schwartz tells that, uh, that about her father. She has no idea. She's with us, by the way. Oh, is she? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's nice. Good morning, <laughs> yeah. Agnes. But Agnes has never saw the uh, Ron Wallenberg pass of her father. I wish she did. Believe me, she had it. I would, I would beg for it. But um, this is an example of a letter of him. This is a very important piece, by the way. So we're talking about the, the righteous, obviously, now the people who risk their lives to save Jewish lives. And um, Danny, what are we looking at here? So this right here, I, this lady in, in Chicago, a Polish woman born in 1953, she married a Holocaust survivor from Majdanek, a twin who was discovered in 1995 by uh, her, his sister, uh, Ida Kurz. And long story short is she was getting married a few years ago in Chicago. I helped her with her, her green card and I sponsored her. And in return, she gave me all the documents and the medal, the Yad Vashem Righteous Medal that her parents got and her uncle who was murdered. And there's Sophia right in the middle, a little girl. Her parents took 22, uh, 17 Jews or 17. 17 Jews and hid them in a barn for 22 months in Poland. Their house burned down twice. Sophia's uncle was murdered when he was running guns or food back and forth. And I have all the letters and all the documents from Yad Vashem proving their story. And by right in the lower side here, here are Sophia's parents right here. And they are the righteous among nations. And Sophia, who's not Jewish, married a Holocaust survivor a few years ago. So I think it's pretty cool. And it's the only Yad Vashem medal I have. Sophia never spoke about this. But she spoke to uh, Carmel Catholic High School students, because she's Catholic, and spoke to a class uh, run by Jim Schuster, who's on this call, by the way. And here is the Righteous Among Nations medal, the original. I let students, I let students pick up and hold the piece. I want them to flip it around, touch it, hold it with respect, with respect. I want them to connect with every single piece. Every single piece. This is the original metal. And they get to hold it. I like that. I want them to connect. There are good people. There were many, many thousands of good, 20, 27,000 people recognized by Yad Vashem. Unfortunately, it was not enough. We needed a lot more. But that's something. I'm sure some of you will uh, recognize this uh this the name on this envelope or the committee here, the British Committee for Children in Prague. 
This is a letter which was sent to uh, the city of Brno, the German name Brun, uh, in Czechoslovakia to a woman named Nelly Polgarova. Uh, and the British Committee for Children in Prague was actually a rather small committee known mostly for uh, the man um, named Sir Nicholas Winton, who uh, with the help of uh, just a few others, rescued 669 mostly Jewish children. And so in this, uh, in this envelope would have been uh, instructions sent to uh, the parents of this child who was uh, scheduled to become part of the kinder transport from Czechoslovakia on a train through Europe, through Germany, uh, through the Netherlands and to Safe Harbor in England. Can you zoom out for one moment? Mm -hmm. So just to give uh, the students on the call here, because again, I look at you and your hair is so full and everybody's so young, is that every single piece has a story. We try to limit the, the amount of text because we want them to really focus on the object. But Keith and I, we do get a little crazy and we try to squeeze in maybe too much information. Uh, but the original author, the original creative of, the, of this exhibit, the first uh, 230 pieces or so, his name is Ken Lawrence. He wanted to have less words and more showing about the artifact itself. I must confess, as we get new material, we struggle with how many, <laughs> how many words to put on the document. But this is an example where you can see, it's hard to see right here, but it, it, it starts up on here and it goes all the way down. But this is the whole story of Nicholas Winton. And by the way, is Scott and the team, Barbara Winton is a very good friend of mine. I did her book tour. Barbara Winton is the daughter of Sir Nicholas Winton. She's speaking in Ohio uh, April 7th on Zoom, but she'd be great for one of your programs in the future. She's wonderful. Of course, the problem is it's set eight hours later in England, but she's wonderful, a great speaker. So this letter was sent to Nelly Polgarova in Brno, um, which is an appropriate segue to our next section on the children, uh, because that letter was sent to the mother of this child. This is Renata Polgarova, who became Renata Laxova. Uh, here she is probably in, um, at what? First grade. Age seven years old. Mm -hmm. First grade, she's born. Yep. Yes. Yep. And so I just wanted uh, you to have a, a picture of her. This is a dear friend of um, uh, my family and Danny's family uh, who was- But she's holding a pencil, keep that in mind. By accident, over the years, if you're gonna zoom in, Keel, mm -hmm. what we've discovered is that the survivors living today they were very young at the time, and by many pieces of fortunate luck, a lot of what they, was saved in their life were drawings, stories about themselves and little things they drew. So now we have a special table dedicated to children and their artwork. And what were they thinking? What was in the minds of a child through their artwork in the ghettos and the camps? So we'll keep that in mind or in hiding. So Anne Frank read, kept a diary. Renata was that she drew things. We have many survivors who donated material just because they were able to um, draw and write. So Renata was seven years old in the spring of 1939, living in uh, Czechoslovakia. And her parents told her they made the difficult decision that she would be traveling to England alone, all alone, to live with a family that she had never met for the remainder of the war. And when she learned that uh, England had a royal family with two princesses named Elizabeth and Margaret who are about her age, Renata wrote a letter to them in German and she left it on her parents' nightstand. Uh, it was never mailed, um, but we'll uh, show you the letter here in just a second. On this front side, we see a Mother's Day card uh, featuring a picture of a tulip. It's addressed uh, from Renata to her mother, probably written in May, 1939, and it reads in Czech, uh, dear mommy, well, it says tulip on the top, dear mommy, for having worked so hard all year round, here's a drawing from you, your daughter, from Renata on Mother's Day. This is days before she's leaving for England. I want to turn it over and read it. I love it. I love when students read the next part. On the back side, she writes a, a letter to the princess. Kia, why don't you read that to them? It's really powerful. So keep in mind that she's writing to the royal family of England. She says, my dear princesses, my mommy has told me about you how sweet you are, and therefore I would like to come to England. Apart from that these are, diff these are bad times, ask your daddy if he permits you to play with me. Please answer me soon. I'm enclosing a photograph so that you know what I look like. Many greetings from Renata. 
and um, what's <laughs> precious, precious. So, so you're amazing. you're thinking about the mind of a child who would become a refugee essentially in uh, just a matter of months, um, and the trauma that these children endured, um, the resilience they showed, uh, the world that they lived in, um, just unthinkable in so many ways. Uh, an interesting anecdote about this letter to the princesses is that uh, Renata went on to marry a man um, who was a veterinarian and uh, they lived in England. They, they fled to England, actually. They were saved by the same Quaker family twice, uh, once in 1938 and another in 1968 after the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, saved by the same Quaker family. And while in England, uh, her husband, the veterinarian, got an emergency call to deliver puppies for Queen Elizabeth, which he did successfully. Good. Next. By the way, we have tens and tens of letters and drawings uh, of Renata. And sadly, she passed away last November, shockingly, just very sad. So here we have one of at least 25 drawings. I just donated one of these drawings to uh, uh, a museum in Florida. And I have about 10, 10 drawings that are gonna be given to the Shanghai Jewish Refugee Museum in Shanghai. This is uh, a drawing by Doris Fogel, her, name, her married name. And if you scroll up, uh, Keel, this is our introduction to children's art because we want children to understand that who drew this it's just any girl could be living anywhere in the world, drawing pictures of a barn or a farm or the sun or the sky or anything. It could be anybody. And so uh, seeing these drawings in volume, while this girl from Germany who lost her father and the mother took her to Shanghai as a refugee, how she used art as her form of of let's say in those days you would call it therapy. And so we have a lot of her drawings. And she told me last year, Danny, they're really, they're really worthless. No one's going to want these. I said, oh my God, Doris, I love these. These are wonderful. It shows you that we can communicate with students of all ages. So this is just one example of many, many drawings of Doris and other children of the Holocaust era. So Danny, now we're gonna to get to um, one of your favorite drawings here through uh, the stamp collection of Gary Sternberg. So we're getting a little bit of a uh, shadow. Sorry about that. So you can, that, that, we're getting a little bit of a shadow on this. But back in, oh, that's a, that's a long, that's a little better. You can still get a picture. This is a, what this is right here. This is a book, a German opera book, a German opera book. And back in the day, you students, stamp collecting was very popular. It was right now, right now, knitting and gardening are number one hobbies. But back in the day, it was stamp collecting. So you buy stamp albums and each page, you would put the stamps from each country. Well, this German boy, Gary Sternberg, who's still with us in Las Vegas, he would take a German opera book and each page put a country like England, Argentina, and you put stamps because stamps were like a currency back in the day. They were worth a lot of money. And what he did is he took this German book and he took flour, cooking flour, mixed it with water to make glue and put his address within the Shanghai ghetto or the Jewish de the designated area for stateless refugees. So there's his address on this German opera book using flour and water as, as uh, glue and he made his own stamp album. So each page, each page of this German opera book is, in, is a country with stamps in it. We, put it. we protected it and we told the story of Gary right here so you could see. So this is really interesting, his whole story about how he got from Germany when he was born August 25th, 1931. He became one of the best uh, Caesar Palace uh, blackjack dealers, and a ping pong table tennis champion. Champion. He's one of the founders of the Table Tennis Ping Pong Association of America because he learned how to play table tennis or ping pong in China. So let's go back to another one. This is one of two books. So you see England, Argentina. You see the opera in German. Now let's go to another book. This is another book he, he made, same stamp. But on this one, if you zoom in, 
And one page, I guess that country is Bahrain, right? Bahrain. If you look closely, he wrote, he drew pictures of tanks pointing at Hitler's face. So these are uh, tanks and his people watching Hitler with guns pointing to his face. Here's a boy at the time, he was born in 31, so he's maybe 10 years old, 12 years old, drawing pictures of Hitler with tanks. I asked Gary about this. He says he has no idea. He, it's, it's his handwriting, but he has no idea why he drew the picture. He doesn't remember drawing the picture. And he was going to throw away these books because who cares about little stamp albums? And I think this is an amazing artifact of a child, how to make a toy, how to do something, you know, get his mind, keep his mind occupied by making his own stamp album, collecting stamps. He just wants to be a child. It's a pretty good representation of Hitler too. Uh, Kevin, did you, did you ever ask Gary about uh, this particular drawing? Uh, well, regarding this drawing, um, it, it actually says Bayern. So he's, he's referring to Bavaria here. So Bavaria. naturally associating uh, Hitler with Bavaria. Um, but yeah, I, I also, uh, and also displayed this um, at, at Valparaiso University and um, just the interesting that he has the tanks and the tanks are shooting at the head, the floating head of Hitler. Um, it's quite a, quite a piece. Yeah. Um, so we'll hear more from Kevin about uh, how he uses uh, these documents in the classroom. Um, but now we're moving on to our last segment, which is about the legacy. What is uh, the after effects of the Holocaust, um, this promise of never again, uh, genocides that have carried on for decades. And here we have three pieces um, that are showing us evidence of the genocide in uh, Rwanda in 1994. This is an ID card, an all important ID card, um, which were, these were instituted in uh, 1932 by Belgian colonial authorities, um, denoting on um, this side here. Let me see if I can zoom, zoom in. in. Yeah, 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 mark off that he was a Tutsi. You can see up here on this top line, <laughs> Um, in first in Kenya Rwanda language, and then under that in the unbolded language is French, so uh, ethnicity. And you can see there are four options here Hutu, Tutsi, Twa, and naturalized citizen. So he had to cross off the Hutu, cross off the Twa, and naturalized, and then the only thing left is Tutsi. And this man's name is, is uh, William, and he was in a church with his brother, Albert. And a, a grenade was thrown into the church. And Albert, who's with us and still with us in Rwanda, he managed to take out the only piece of DNA, the only DNA of his brother, uh, William. And it says on top here, you know, uh, he was born in 1968. He was a farmer. His favorite sport was football or soccer. His favorite foods were bananas, beans, sweet potatoes. I asked these questions of his brother. His favorite drink was milk. He enjoyed making people laugh. He was humble. Cause of death was a grenade attack in his church on April 14th. It's coming up, 1994. His last words were, my God, my God. So his brother Albert started a Holocaust and genocide, a genocide center in uh, Kigali, Rwanda. And uh, I really wanted this card. And I gave him a very generous donation. And he gave me... The, his brother's ID card. So I will keep your brother alive. I will tell your brother's story. I don't know how. I'm not an expert on Rwanda, but I'll do something. Students will hold this ID card. And that's one of three ID cards that uh, I got from Albert. And so now we'll have a look at uh, another ID card from Rwanda in 1994. Um, actually, this, this particular card was uh, printed before 1994, but this is a man named Vincent. Uh, he, was, um, he was a perpetrator. Uh, he participated in uh, killing of um, people and was uh, sentenced to time in prison. Um, some interesting things to note about this uh, ID card, you can see again up at the top, the only one not crossed off. 
uh, is Hutu, indicating that this man is Hutu. Um, he was born in 1947. On the right side of the page, uh, numbers one through nine there, those are his children. And in the very bottom corner here, this is a box for signature. And he signed with his fingerprint, which indicates what? Probably that he is illiterate. Um, and so this man, uh, Vincent, um, he was accused of participating in acts of genocide in Wogo sector currently in the Eastern province. He was arrested in 1995. He spent eight years in the Bujasera prison and he was released in 2003 via presidential pardon because Rwanda had this problem of up to 10% of the population who participated in a genocide. How can a country so small um, bring that many people to justice? The, the trials would take decades and decades. Uh, nobody would still be alive by that point. And so it's, uh, Rwanda has experimented with these programs of pardon, uh, forgiveness, reconciliation, and so forth. Um, so Vincent was born in 1947. He was 46 or 47 years old at the time of the genocide. And in this photo here, uh, he was probably 33 or 34 years old. I should note that Vincent is alive. I've not met him personally. I'm supposed to meet him. I'm in that last trip to Rwanda, which never happened because of COVID. He agreed to be videotaped. He was scared. Originally, it took me about a year to get these ID cards from Vincent and the next one because they were scared. And I told him, please don't worry, you will not be, uh, this is not going to be used against you in any way, and it's for educational purposes. And uh, I have pictures of him today, and I, I look forward to interviewing him uh, professionally. And so here we'll take a look at the third um, ID card from Rwanda, and this is a woman named Vestine. Uh, you can see in the top line again, what's, what's her ethnicity in this ID card? She's Hutu. The only one not crossed off is Hutu. Uh, so in the lower uh, right corner of the left-hand page here, she has signed it. Um, she was a student when this was taken. She has no children and uh, she was not, she did not participate. She was not a perpetrator. Um, and uh, she was 26 years old at the time of the genocide. So uh, we can only speculate at some of the differences between Vestine, uh, this young woman, and Vincent, the farmer with nine children. Um, you know, what, what were some of the reasons why one person who was identified as Hutu participated in the genocide and another didn't? And that is uh, a lot of the, What's amazing about not just this piece, but just a couple weeks ago, the Illinois Holocaust Museum uh, opened up their Nelson Mandela exhibit. And in the exhibit, there are several ID cards that you must carry around in South Africa at the time you know, during apartheid. I do not have uh, any ID cards yet. I will absolutely get, because of the Nelson Mandela, he's one of my heroes, I will absolutely get ID cards for uh, the South African apartheid. They're not that hard to get. I just never look for them. And um, so that's also be part of our exhibit. So another dimension of the legacy is what happens to succeeding generations of the victims and survivors. Um, and here we're going to take a look at a uh, postcard um, this is a postcard that was sent by a man named Isaac Weintraub from the ghetto in Dombrova in Poland to his daughter Hanka Weintraub at the slave labor camp in Glunberg in Schlesen, uh, also in Poland, which is today Zielona Gora. Uh, this is an occupied Poland postmarked April 7th, 1942. And you can see that uh, it's not in good shape. Danny, why is this postcard not in good shape? So Jack Sander is a docent at the Illinois Holocaust Museum. He was actually born in a DP camp. And it's a miracle, a miracle that his mother was able to receive postcards from her father and her sister. So she was in a concentration camp and then the father and sister were in the ghetto. I think I got that right, right, Keel? I'm pretty uh, sure. Correct, yes. And so for some reason, she was able to save tens and tens of postcards, tens and tens of postcards that she received. And 
in, when she was transferred from camp to camp, she was able to save these postcards. And after the war, she kept them with him. She kept them with her. And Jack, the son, folded them up in saran wrap and kept it, kept it in his wallet. These Jewish mail, Jewish correspondence from camps to ghetto, Jewish to Jewish inmate mail is extremely rare and valuable, expensive. And he took these postcards and folded them up and kept them in his wallet as a memory. And he would give away some of these postcards to various people. When his mother passed away some years ago, when she was lowered down into the, into the ground, they threw postcards into the grave. So she'd be buried with these postcards, buried with her family that was murdered in, in the Holocaust. And Jack gave me uh, three postcards to pick one. <laughs> so I put this one in a display exhibit piece and another one I have just laying there, just laying there on the side with no barriers. And the third postcard, I said, can you please entrust one of these postcards to Robert Jan van Pelt? You might know Robert Jan van Pelt from the movie Denial. He's the Auschwitz crematorium expert, but he's also a major stamp collector. That's how Robert and I became friends is uh, we're both stamp collectors. So he gets one postcard as well. But it's amazing how a, a child, while well, he was born in a DP camp of survivors, would keep postcards. He still has one with him in his wallet. He folds it up and carries it with him every single day. I wanted one that he did carry in his wallet. This is how he preserves the memory, how he tells his story. As a docent, he pulls it out of his pocket, a postcard. And so when we interviewed Jack uh, last year, he said, I carry it to remember my mother. And when I think times are tough, it puts things in perspective. No matter how hard things are, it can't be as bad as what she went through. As a kid, I wasn't really interested because I had a hard time believing some of the things she was saying. I couldn't believe some humans would do that to other humans. She started telling me when I was about 10. My dad never spoke about his experiences, but my mother did. She would tell me horror stories and I couldn't comprehend it at that age. In those days, the 1950s or early 60s, nobody really talked about it. So expand it, go back, go, go up a little bit. So what Keel just read is printed on the postcard. And here, if you turn it over, um, we show both sides. All our new pieces that we have in our exhibit, we cut them, we die cut the center. So the students or anybody can pick it up and they can turn it back and forth. Sometimes we, we show one side of something. They, and the students are always curious what's on the other side. Even if there's nothing on the other side, they still flip the page. So because we want students to pick everything up, we are die cutting both sides. And we tell the whole story. So Hanka Weintraub, Jack's mom, she talked about it. Uh, Jack talked about it. We know we know about her story. Um, but Danny, you wanted to show this postcard here. Is this our last piece? Uh, yes. This is our last piece. So I hope you enjoyed our little presentation. I'm still frustrated over the shadow, but we'll get that fixed. This is unbelievable. Well, to me, I'm sorry. It's for me. It's unbelievable. So. After the war, Oscar Schindler, Oscar Schindler had nowhere to go. He had no money. He ended up living with Jewish people. So my friend, Simon Waxberg from Memphis, Tennessee, he married a Holocaust survivor named Mina, Mina Singer. Mina Singer was a capo. So she was in charge of making sure, disciplining Jewish inmates in the women's barracks. So Mina and Simon get married after the war. And their friends come to them and say, please, can you take in a, a, a good Nazi? He needs a place to stay. A good Nazi? What's a, what do you mean by a good Nazi? What's a good Nazi? It was Oscar Schindler who lived with Mina and with Simon. And then Oscar came home one day and says, I have visas and I'm going to get you to Argentina. And I, you just have to pretend like you're, you're, you're Christian. And Simon, I'm not going to tell you what he said exactly because he swore, but he says, F you, you know, I just survived the Holocaust. I'm going to be Jew. I'm staying a Jew. So they were very friendly. So Oscar and his wife, Irina, go to South America and Simon and Mina go to Memphis, Tennessee. They never saw each other again, by the way. But Oscar and Mina stayed very, very close with Oscar's secretary, Martha. 
who actually lived in Texas, and then her son moved to Georgia. So after Mina passed away some years ago, Morris Rosen from the US Holocaust Museum, a collector, was selling his collection of ghetto material. And because I helped him, he gave me this postcard written by Mina Singer in 1943. Look at how small she was able to fit on that postcard. So this is a postcard that Mina Singer wrote while she was during the Holocaust as a capo in the Holocaust. Unfortunately, the reason I'm showing this piece is that I wish she was alive so I can have interviewed her and talked to her and got her side of the story, but she never spoke. Like many Holocaust survivors, Simon and his wife, Mina Singer, who wrote this postcard, never spoke. But when Mina passed away, Simon decided to spend his time speaking to students when he was much, much older. But unfortunately, I got this postcard a few years ago as a gift, and I'm not unable to share it and talk to Mina, but I did share it with her daughters, uh, her twin daughters, who they live in Texas. The one surviving daughter lives in Texas. So it just, what it just illustrates is that we don't have time to, we now have to take postcards that we find and put the pieces together ourselves in a very careful way without exaggerating or embellishing a story. I wanted to show this too. Uh, so here we see, um, mm. this is actually a uh, picture of Mina Singer. She's pointing here. She's in Volary, Czechoslovakia. Um, people might recognize the name of that town from uh, the story of Gerda Weissman Klein. This is where the death march from Grunberg in Schlesien in Poland uh, concluded in Volary. And here we have, after the war, this is Mina Singer with a Jewish chaplain named Herman Dicker of Brooklyn, New York, the 5th Infantry Division of the 3rd U.S. Army. Uh, and Mina is uh, directing a German civilian starting to exhume the corpses of Jewish women who were starved to death by German SS troops in the 500 mile march across Czechoslovakia. So here's Mina uh, pointing to where these eight friends of hers were buried in a mass grave in Volary. Well, Mina, Mina was instructed to help the allies. If you, if you look at Mina in the pictures right after the war, she was very healthy, very chubby, and she was well fed. She was a capo, but uh, Morris Rosen and everybody who tells me she was a good capo. She took care of her, her Jewish uh, inmates, fellow inmates. And um, so our final piece here on this uh, segment, Danny, is um, something that Jim Schuster will recognize. These are pieces from, go ahead, Danny. So what we try to do is, is and Jim Schuster, who's on this call, got me involved in this little task is that when he had his classes at Carmel Catholic High School, the students had time to go find a piece that reaches them, that what, it, what makes, what touches them. And they can write an essay as if they were that piece, how they feel being that piece, how they feel being that total scroll, how they feel about being the Nazi armband. And one student wrote amazingly saying, don't be afraid of me, I'm alone, not evil, the symbol. The man who wore me is evil. I felt degraded when I was wearing this on this man's shoulder, uh, uh, shoulder. So the students get to write an essay as if they were the piece or write about the piece or write to that piece. So this is uh, just an example, one of many examples. We have hundreds and hundreds of examples. And the good ones, we actually laminate them. We take the original handwriting and we type out their words and we put the exhibit piece next to it. So we could post them and it gives the readers an idea of what other people think about these pieces. When we exhibit with students, we do not show these. We keep this off. We don't want students to cheat and just copy something down. But we want the adult readers to understand that uh, this exhibit's powerful and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of students write essays about the various pieces. And we have a database of which pieces talk the most. So it's the students that help me pick out out of the thousands of pieces we have, we let the students pick out the top few hundred pieces that resonate with them and we display them. And I think we're done. We did pretty good, Keel. I think we're only three minutes behind schedule. Okay, well, we're not entirely done. We're entering our question and answer uh, well, phase. Kevin, though. But yeah, we want to um, talk with uh, our friend and uh, colleague and co-conspirator here, Kevin Ostoyich. Um, 
Kevin, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do as an educator and how you use this collection. Thank you. Yes, uh, I, I use this material with my, in my courses at Valparaiso University. Uh, my whole philosophy is that I, I want students to get involved and learn actively, but I also want them to be involved in the process of educating others. So uh, what we do here is we, we have the students working with the materials actively, uh, and some of them are, are working in our university archives, and they work with the materials, they are scanning the materials uh, as they are learning what it means to be an archivist and how does how does one work behind the scenes and they uh they work with scanning the materials but also they come up with displays so the students have actively created displays so that they are actually in the process of of educating others so i have here two boxes uh two boxes of materials from the spungen collection um the first is uh of Harry Katz, the Harry Katz collection. Uh, this is a former Shanghai Jewish refugee um, and his, his items. And we have as well, Gary Sternberg. You remember Gary Sternberg with his stamp collection. Uh, and here, for example, is an official uh, table covering for a blackjack table at Caesar's Palace. That's and we have all sorts of items from uh, Gary's, Gary's life. And the students helped to create a library display all uh, about Gary's life. They have also created a library display devoted to the, the life of Harry Katz. So uh, students work in the archives, they work with the materials and they create displays so that they are then educating all the other students who are in the library at any given time. Uh, also, uh, I use the materials to inspire students to create plays and then they actually write the script of these plays and then they, they, actually, then they, uh, they perform these plays to the, the public. Uh, we have, uh, uh, as of this date, we have created three plays uh, where the students have taken these materials, they've been inspired by these materials, and then they have written three plays uh, regarding the Shanghai experience. The first was called Knocking on the Doors of History, the Shanghai Jews. The second was a musical uh, that was uh, the Shanghai Carousel, What Tomorrow Will Be. And then the third was done during COVID and we switched it from a live performance to a radio theater performance, which is now available on YouTube. And actually Danny Spungen provided one of the voices. He played one of the characters. And in that case, we had the students learn the learned about Shanghai from these materials as well as oral testimony. And then they wrote the play, but then because of COVID, and the fact that we made it a radio theater play, I then contacted a number of the Shanghai Jewish refugees uh, and they actually performed with the students uh, from their houses. So they recorded their parts. So the actual play that's available on YouTube is, is Valpo students who wrote the material and Shanghai Jewish refugees who are playing the parts of, uh, in, in the case of Harry Abraham, uh, playing the part of his grandfather. Uh, so uh, that's another way in which students have used these materials and then they have, um, uh, they're part of the process of educating others. Um, another, another way in which I use these materials is in a rather sly way. Um, I created a, a workshop in which we try to promote research to first year students. So first, uh, my, my idea is to get students involved right from the get-go, not wait until they're seniors uh, to do research. I want to try to stimulate this research right from the, from, right the get-go. And this event called the Engage, Explore, and Express Workshop has 
been so successful that it has been incorporated into the full first year program, the core program at Valpo. So I do this workshop uh, every semester. And here's why I'm sly. Uh, I, in, I incorporate the Spungen materials into each one of these workshops as a way of showing off these materials to all first year students at Valpo every year. So every, every first year student gets at least some indication, some uh, education about the Holocaust through this workshop. And I bring in these materials and then basically the, the format of this workshop is that I say, well, what, what is in this box? What, 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 what can we find in here? And then we then go through the process of what, what is research and how, how does one do a research project? And we use the materials from the Spungen collection as a hypothetical project that we're all working on. How would we do this? How would we tell the story of, of Harry Katz, for example, when I bring in Harry Katz? Um, so we have students who are working in the archives. We have students who are working on the stage. We have students who are creating displays and then students who are learning at this in their first year experience and learning how to do research. All these are active ways for students to interact with these materials. And then they are the ones who then educate others about the Holocaust in many different ways. Uh, so these are just ways you know, in which I've worked with, with Danny to try to figure out how can, how can we come up with new ways to get students actively engaged with this material and not just for themselves, but we want them to then use these materials to, to educate their peers about the Holocaust. Right, uh, Kevin, thanks so much for uh, what you're doing and for your partnership. And um, you know, when we talk about evidence and critical thinking skills, um, what you're doing to my mind uh, is activating a whole different level of skills in creating a shift in mindset, you know, helping students become not just consumers of knowledge, but producers of knowledge, uh, which, um, yeah, just sharpens those critical thinking skills is going to serve them, it's going to serve society uh, as a whole. So thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and now we are open for your questions. Uh, and that can be for uh, Danny, it can be for Kevin, can be for the pieces. Um, so uh, please uh, don't hold back if anybody has questions. Um, we're happy to we're happy to answer. Thank you, gentlemen. This was this was a very different presentation than we've ever had for the week of understanding. And we have an, a pretty intimate group, so feel free to take yourself off chat and just ask or off mute and ask the question. You can also type it in chat and um, Keel and I will keep our eye on the chat. Well, I do have something to say with Kevin on, online here. Uh, some years ago, I purchased a Jehovah Witness collection. This one man was in how many camps? How many concentration camps? He Five. was in a total of with with prisons and camps, eight different uh eight different places. Wow. And I got this collection. I would say, how many postcards and letters, uh, oh, Kevin? Hundreds, hundreds. This uh, is uh, Ernst Schwamm is his name. Right, and as a matter of fact, it's this Ernst Schwamm now is featured at the Traveling Holocaust exhibit that's gonna be in St. Louis. I'm sorry, uh, Kansas City, Missouri in June. Right now it's in New York. So this guy Ernst Schwamm, this Jehovah Witness, uh, went through all these camps and literally there must be at least a hundred different postcards and photographs most of which I gave to Valparaiso University to do research. Because when I approached the Jehovah Witness uh, Association, I don't know who I spoke to in the headquarters, I said, I, I bought this exhibit and I like to highlight the Jehovah Witness and I need help translating. And they told me, well, that's your responsibility <laughs> to get it translated. I said, whoa. So I never, I never did anything with this collection for years until I gave it to, uh, I wanted this story to be told because it's pretty amazing that this, this Jehovah Witness survived the war and his wife saved all these correspondences from all these different camps and, and concentration camps and prisons. And uh, we're just now getting, uh, Kevin is just now translating some of the pieces and the Auschwitz traveling exhibit, the Auschwitz traveling exhibit, they have three pieces. So the story is getting out there 
but there's so much to uncover. That's a major reason that someone could do their PhD on that collection alone. Yeah. I, it's a great example, Danny, because I have used that collection in the Engage, Explore, and Express workshop. So I've, I've highlighted that. And then we had to come up as a, as a whole group with all of the first year students, what, what's the title of this? And we came up with 25 words as the title of a project because uh, this ties into what Danny was saying. Sometimes the, the postal privileges of, of, of camp members were restricted. And uh, Erchwan was in Buchenwald on two occasions. And on one of the occasions he had his uh, correspondence restricted to uh, one, one letter per month. And it could only be 25 words long. So I use the example, I'm glad Danny, you brought up the example of, of texting. I always, I always start when I talk about Ernst Schwamm, I have the students, I say, how many of you have one of these things? And they laugh and of course they say, yeah. And I say, how many of you have texted today? And they laugh and they say, yeah, everybody raises their hand. I say, how many of you have texted while I've been talking? And they you know, sheepishly say, yeah. I said, I, can, I understand, uh, but you know, how many do you do of these a day? And then I said, well, imagine if you could only send one text per month and it could only be 25 words long. Who would you send it to? Uh, what would you say? Um, and then that really gets their attention because you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you even hypothetically think about restricting their, their texting, that gets mm -hmm. this generation's attention. So uh, that really brings it home. But so Engage, Explore, and Express workshop, but also I have used the Schwamm collection in my Holocaust class. And here's one thing, a lot of people are afraid to use these materials because they assume, well, the students can't read German. So how are they gonna do anything? Well, letters are great because you don't really need to read the language to be able to do something as a student. Um, so I had the students in the class, each student had to get one letter and they had to record where was it from so they could find the where it was sent from, who was it sent to, who wrote it and what was the date, right? All that was in required there was to say that in, in Europe, you switch the, the month and the day and then they could understand, but then they could write. So each student could be part of the process of processing this collection by, 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 by identifying those. So even though none of them spoke German or read German, they could all be part of that process. Uh, also, uh, students, have um, are currently three students are currently digitizing the whole the whole collection and those are students who are in the archive program so this one collection has been used in so many different ways at Valpo um, and and the students have been in part of all of those different uh, those different ways and so and, and there will be a, a, a library display uh, within the next month. That, that highlights some of this. So that, that's kind of four different ways in which this one collection is being used by students to educate wow. others. Yeah. So we have one question. It was a, it's a very interesting question uh, about, I'm a collector and how our relationship uh, is with museums like the US Holocaust Museum and Yad Vashem uh, is a general broad statement, just a general uh, and there's no, there's a lot of answers to this, but in general, museums, they hate us. They hate, in a very friendly, loving way, they hate collectors like myself. We are the enemy. We are everything nasty, brutal. We are the, we are the worst thing that can happen to an artifact, that we don't take care of them. We don't preserve them. We put the artifacts at risk for uh, being robbed, being stolen, being vandalized. Uh, when I first started collecting, when I got this collection, uh, the exhibit, I bought an exhibit, really. And within a very short time, the two top curators from the U.S. Holocaust Museum flew out to Chicago. And I had my parents, they were, they were alive at the time. I said, you, be, you better be here with me. I don't know what to expect. So they were encouraging me to give them all the artifacts and let me give Xerox copies to the students. And I said to them, you're insulting me. You're looking at someone who got a 12 on their ACT. I don't read. I live and I learn history and geography through picking up stamps, artifacts. I learned ge geology from stealing rocks from my neighbor's houses when I was a little kid. So I said, it's a selfish thing that the U.S. Holocaust Museum wants to have everything. 
they built a $45 million archival unit. They can't, they only display 3% of what they have, but I believe they need to have everything, at least one of everything. There's something called the White Rose. The White Rose was a bunch of students in Germany, in Munich, that were German students who were going against the German government. They were printing out these flyers and they all got arrested. Very few flyers exist, but William Kaczynski had an extra White Rose flyer. And I didn't have one. I really wanted that resistance a piece. But I agreed with him. I said, you should give it to the US Holocaust Museum because God forbid <laughs> something happens to it. So yes, we are very competitive. They want everything and they want to donate it, of course. We're collectors, we'll, we'll buy things. Um, of course, now I don't have to buy anything. I get a lot of donations because I have earned my reputation now. Of I will make sure that students around the world who don't have the opportunity to go to Yad Vashem or U.S. Holocaust Museum, I'll give them the opportunity to, to use and hold these pieces. Let's face it, who goes to Yad Vashem? Ladies and gentlemen, students, who goes to Yad Vashem? All those people who already believe in it. You know, deniers don't go to Yad Vashem. Those who believe in the Holocaust or are educated, they go to Israel, Yad Vashem. Who goes to the Holocaust Museum are much more broader students. I bring our exhibit to Montana, to Greece, to China. Our exhibit is translated into Greek. It's uh, translated into Chinese. So I reach thousands of students who would never have an opportunity to learn about the Holocaust. But I personally, I love museums. I'm very, I'm on the board of, of, the, of the Candles Holocaust Museum. Josef Mengele wrote five letters, five letters from Auschwitz that are known, five known letters that he wrote from Auschwitz. I have two of those letters and I give them to Candles Holocaust Museum, which is dedicated to the story of the Mengele twins. And they have it on loan. And when I travel around the world, they give it back to me so I can borrow it from my exhibits. So when I need something from the university, my idea is to get these pieces traveling. But when you deal with museums, rightfully, they have to have a very strict order to make sure there's the right temperature, right lighting, right atmosphere. You need, a, you need perfection. And I understand that. I really do. Uh, I live in an imperfect world because I'm imperfect. And I like to make sure that these pieces get to be seen held by as many people as possible. So I think, I think I'm, a, you nice, I'm a nice niche within the museum world. I am the traveling museum. And if you like what you see in my exhibit, please spend a lot of time at Yad Vashem in the US Holocaust Museum. But there's no question we're competitive. So Danny, uh, I just, <laughs> I wanna add to, you know, you're making it sound like um, we're just like people are willy nilly just practically making paper airplanes out of these pieces. I mean, you do conserve, conserve and preserve the pieces. They're all in, uh, you know, acid free sleeves. Nobody ever touches the piece directly. Well, they touch the Jewish star and they touch the Nazi armband that they do touch. And I let them touch the skin of the Torah. So I have an opening on the Torah scroll, the Phil Tug letter uses an envelope. I let them put their finger and touch the, touch the animal skin touch the skin of the Torah. I, I, I believe in that. It's, it's like, do you want to have the kids go inside the cattle car like they do in the Illinois Holocaust Museum? Or do you want to have something roped, roped across in Yad Vashem where the cattle car is looking up to the sky? There's no right or wrong answer. But in regard to conservation, I spray every single piece, archival spray to take remove the acid. It's very expensive. Other museums, they can't do it. They don't have the money to archive and spray thousands of pieces. I spray every piece, very expensive, but it's okay, it's, we, we can do it. But uh, I do love museums and they're great, but of course we are competitive and, uh, but most of the museums are great. But Yad Vashem and U.S. Holocaust Museum, they want it all, no doubt about it. <laughs> I, yeah, I, we, we all love museums and um, from my perspective, it's, it's an entire ecosystem and we can all work together to fill certain gaps and niches. You know, museums are in the business of preserving history for 100 or 500 years um, and they can't take risks that a collector like Danny or the foundation can. So that's, that's where we can help reach some audiences that perhaps they couldn't. Uh, so there's a question here about, uh, do I travel around the country going to stamp stores or, or, or buying? I don't buy anything direct. Uh, 
we know a lot of people in the Holocaust community. So in the last five, six years, uh, people donate material to us, or we give them honorariums. We'll give money to a museum in their honor, like the, the, the Dominican Republic piece I have. We gave a donation to the Seattle Holocaust Museum in the honor of the family. They gave me the piece about their family. But generally speaking, I, I have agents who buy on my behalf because if I buy something and that piece is, is fake or it's illegitimate or something's wrong with it, my reputation goes down the drain. So to get to buy the Mengel letters, we got that from Mengele's son. But I went through three different people to keep my name out of that picture. I didn't want to be known as buying something from Mengele's son. But Keel, that's how I met Keel. I met Keel because he found out through one of the, was it FBI or something? FBI agent? Secret Service. Secret ironically. Service agent gave him my name. He knows me. He knew I bought the Mengele letters through three other parties. It's amazing. So Keel called me. I hung up on him. I said, Who, who's this guy? I, I, I was scared. And it's a great story how we met. And uh, now our foundation, we love him. He's, he's, a, he's a gift to humanity. But I do not go to stamp stores. We, uh, I have agents. I'm only missing very few things. I want to tell a story. And if I cannot use a piece in the exhibit, then we don't want it. Then we give it to universities on loan and to other museums. So that's how we, we work. But uh, no, I, I, I no longer buy. At the beginning, I was buying because I didn't know what I was doing. I was a collector. And uh, so at the beginning, I was buying. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, Stephen, I'll drop our um, email addresses in the chat here too. Uh, and thank you for your questions. Um, other questions, and uh, Kale, uh, feel free to give us the shepherd's hook whenever we've overstayed. Yeah, our we have time for one more question. Okay. Great thinking. I hope you can feel the passion that we that I have for these little artifacts. I love, I love students. I was in Billings, Montana last week with twelve students. We had Agnes Schwartz is one of our speakers. These kids normally come to my home every year for spring break. And they pay us. And um, this year I went to Montana and the Double Tree Hotel gave us a room. And I had some artifact with me, but instead for every lunch and dinner, it was virtual but personal. We had a Holocaust survivor speak at every single lunch and dinner. And I, I love when I get these survivors to meet and hug the students virtually and then pass around different artifacts and let them study it. So it's really been a, a blessing. Uh, to do all this. We'd like to uh, thank you very much for the passionate uh, presentation this evening. And we look forward to next year, hopefully, when we're all able to be together, along with uh, the University of Nebraska Omaha, and uh, the Rotary organization, uh, local Rotary, uh, who is helping to sponsor it. And we hope that next year, we, we will all be together. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Kale. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a nice evening and a good week. Thank you very much. You guys are muted. Thanks, Lori. Keel, Danny, thank you very much. Thanks, Agnes. See you in the morning. Thank you very much for having us. Appreciate it very much. For everything. It was, thank you so much. That was great, Kevin. Just understanding how it all works with your students and, and especially going for the freshmen. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank right. you. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Why, why wait? I don't understand why everybody waits until they're seniors. Well, you know, because it used to be we didn't think they could handle it. And right. now we know that they need to handle yeah, it to earlier. Handle. Yeah. That's when they, you know, and that gets them passionate about it. Yeah. Right? And a lot of times when they're seniors, they, they're, it's too late. And, and, they're, and they're usually at, at the time when they're doing research, they're also doing job interviews and so distracted. Yeah. Whereas if we get them right from the beginning, then they're, they're not only, it just makes them learn in a different way. I th and, 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 and they, f they connect to things in a, in a way that they, they just didn't connect before. So, I agree. but thanks again for, for, uh, for having me. Yep. Thanks Thank everyone. You. Good night. Good night. All.